Welcome to Mental Survival, the channel where we talk about the mental and psychological aspects of survivalism and prepping. My name is Cliff Hamrick. I'm a professional counselor in Texas, and today we're going to be talking about fear. If you saw my last video, we talked about emotions in general, and now what I want to do in the next few videos is to talk about each one of the primary uh, emotions. Uh, uh, today we're going to talk about fear. The other primary emotions are anger, sadness, and happiness. And we'll be, I'll be making a video on each one of those. Uh, I'm starting with fear because I think fear is the oldest of all the emotions. My, my way of thinking about this is that every organism needs to be afraid at some point in its life. Uh, because fear gives you the information that you might die. If you remember in our last video, emotions are basically just uh, information. And the information that, that fear gives us is that your life is in danger and you need to do something about it. Um, and because every organism has the potential of being killed by something else, uh, then every organism has a need to be afraid. Uh, so even like a thousand pound adult male grizzly bear uh, in his adult form doesn't probably need to be afraid of much of anything. Uh, but at one time he was just a little bitty cub and could have easily been killed by just a coyote. So there's there's that fear. There's also the fear of just uh, not having the needs met to survive. So starving to death, um, thirst, uh, the, the elements, these sort of things. These can also kill us as well. So fear gives us the information that we might be in danger and then we do something with it. And this uh, uh, information that we get is, it, by acting on it properly helps perpetuate us in the future generations. We descended from humans who acted on their fear. We didn't descend from the humans who didn't act on their fear because they're dead. These are the ones who, you know, imagine millions of years ago, someone walking, you know, through the grasslands of the African savanna and they hear rustling in the bushes, or they, they, they notice that they're, they're coming around a blind corner in a path and they can't quite see, you know, the fear is, is that, well, a lion could be laying there waiting to, to, to grab me. Uh, our ancestors went, well, I'm going to go that way then, because there's no lions over there, and if there's a lion over there, then I don't want to have nothing to do with it. Uh, and so our ancestors felt the fear, acted on it, and saved their lives. Our ancestors did not just keep on walking and become lion food because, well, they didn't hang around long enough to really reproduce. And if they did, their children were just as dumb. So we, we descended from people who uh, feel fear and act on it and know how to act on it. Fear is also the most powerful of all the emotions. Our brain lights up when, when we are afraid. Our brain reacts to fear more strongly than any other emotion that we feel. Now, you know, a lot of my, you know, clients, sometimes when I, when I bring that up, they, they're, again, sort of like, well, why do we have to feel so this emotion so strongly? And because, you know, again, it's that survival mechanism. Those of us who didn't feel the fear, didn't act on it, didn't survive. And so we, we have evolved to feel fear and to feel like we need to do something on it. The sad part is, is that I think the first practical use of this information uh, that, that fear is the most powerful of all the emotions, was used actually in advertising. I think going back in the 1920s or 1930s, um, someone figured out that people will act on their fear more strongly than they'll act on any other emotion. So what you do is you give them some stimulus. Remember from our old emotion, from our last video, uh, a stimulus happens, and then we have an emotion, and then we act on it. That's sort of the chain of event. And these are actually three separate chain of events, but if through advertising we can create a scenario, create a stimulus which we're pretty sure we're going to generate fear, uh, then people will be afraid. And then what we'll do is we'll give them the out to absolve their fear. Uh, a, a classic situation is the, um, I call it the, the scared housewife sort of um, advertising. Uh, they usually show these during the middle of the day, uh, this is you know daytime TV during the middle of the week, and they'll do something like they'll they'll show oh you know someone in someone's kitchen they're like oh oh there's germs all over your kitchen, and they'll even have like a little microscope and shows like these little 
computer generated squiggly things floating around and they said germs can make you sick they make your fat no, they don't make you sick they make your family sick or sometimes they'll just flat out say it'll make your your kids sick and so you know no one wants their kids to be sick because if your kids are sick they might die again there's that threat to threat to life it's a threat to the life of someone that you care about so now we've given the stimulus we've even generated the fear and then what advertising does is give you the out but aha brand new extra super tide or whatever it is that will clear out you know a thousand percent of of the germs in your house that at least puts the thought in their head that this thing whatever it is is going to keep my family safe it's going to keep me my kids from getting sick it's going to keep them from dying and that sort of thing and so the next time they're in the grocery store at least that part is floating around in their head because again their brain is responding very strongly to fear and so when they need to buy a new you know uh, uh, soap for their their kitchen or whatever their dishes then part of their brain is going to be kind of remembering oh yeah that that new super duper tide thing that, that gets rid of all the gets rid of all the germs now of course what they don't want you to know is that the vast majority of those germs in the kitchen came off of you and off of your family and they're not going to make anybody sick and they're frankly just everywhere all the time and they're not going to do anything. In fact, we now know, thanks to a lot of scientific evidence, that it's the opposite that's true. Kids don't go outside and play enough. We're, we're not outdoors. We're not bumping into to germs and dust and pollen and molds and these sort of things. And so our bodies never develop uh, healthy immune systems to fight them off. We stay, stay in these nice sterilized environments. They're all clean. And so that actually is what makes us sick. But that's a lot more complicated, and, and you can't make money off of that, right? So, so advertising has been doing that for a while. I, I'd heard a, a story of a newspaper publisher, I believe it was in uh, Chicago, who uh, he was also sick of always publishing bad news because, you know, if you ever watch the news, that's pretty much all it is is it's bad news because it's meant to keep you afraid so that way you'll stay watching so that way they'll show you commercials which will keep you afraid which will make you buy stuff and then the show comes back on that's that's the cycle of modern advertising and modern most modern TV certainly the news and this this publisher he had this idea of like oh, I'm gonna start publishing positive news we're, we're gonna try and do that we're gonna publish more of the positive news he knows that sales went down um, because there's no there's no action. There's no need to to fulfill. If I read the headlines and it says everything is okay in the Middle East, then I don't feel like I need to actually like, know anything more. Well, that's good. I, I don't. There's no emotion attached attached to that. Other uh, than maybe a little bit of happiness of like, oh, everything's okay. That's nice. So, if you put the headlines in war looms in the Middle East or peace talks in a rocky spot in the Middle East. Mideast, you know, Mideast peace talks, not going so well. That gives me cause to fear because that could lead to war, which could lead to a lot of death and destruction, which might hurt me. Probably won't, but that's another topic. But that, that little bit of fear makes me want to do something with it. And in this case, I want to read more about it. In what way are talks breaking down? What, what could be the consequences if talks do break down? What's the chances that talks won't break down? What, what, what's, the, what's the plan? So at least it gives me an idea that I, I need to know something more about what's, what's going to happen here. And so that is how other people use fear to manipulate us. Politics does it all the time. And, and it's been going on, again, for decades. Um, if you watch, if you notice the the date when this is uploaded, this is just a couple of months out from the 2016 presidential elections. Both sides are using fear to generate support. You know, one side is saying, "Well, if you vote for her, she's gonna repeal the Second Amendment and take away all your guns and round up people in the FEMA camps or whatever that sort of thing." And the other side is saying, "Well, if you vote for him, he's gonna start World War III and he's gonna, you know, deport everybody and." put another group of people in FEMA camps or something like that. And so if you look at the polls, really half of each one of these people, people's supporters, are really against the other one. They're not really supporting this candidate because they like him. They're supporting this candidate because they're afraid of the other one. And it's just this crisscross going back and forth. 
Um, politicians have been us using this for, for decades. The, the classic one, um, I think it was in 1964, where the idea was the, the little girl smelling a flower. There's this countdown, and then it explodes with a mushroom cloud. And basically, the, the whole premise was, is, well, if you vote for this guy, he's going to start World War III and kill your kids. And it, it worked to a certain degree. It only showed once, and that was all it took. So people use fear all the time. And one of the reasons why I think this is important in the, the prepping and the survivalism community is I see a lot of people who are driven by fear. They are afraid that something bad is going to happen, and they have to be prepared 24-7 at all times. Um, that leads you to making dumb decisions. Remember in our last video we talked about how powerful emotions will override the logical parts of our brain. So we can't problem solve. We can't form new memories. We can't really uh, make good, sound, logical decisions. We're running on emotions. And fear is one of the worst emotions you want to be running on because fear makes you want to do anything, anything that's going to make you feel safe again. And so people will do some really crazy, stupid stuff, do stuff that they wouldn't normally think about because um, they're running on fear. They're not running on logic anymore. And it's the same thing I see in the, the prepper and the survivalism community is people are running on fear and all it takes is some video on YouTube uh, to talk about how somebody, some government is going to come in and, and take over the world and, and ruin everything and then people are going to act on that. And unfortunately a lot of times what I see is right after that video they're talking about how you need to buy more gold or you need to buy more guns or you need to do something else. They're doing the same sort of advertising trick. Um, you, you have to keep your fear in check. You want to be aware of your fear because again you don't want to be like our ancestors or our, our non-ancestors who just walk straight into the lion's den because they didn't act on their fear. But you don't want to overreact. Um, one of the things that we have to acknowledge is that in modern life uh, we are often afraid, we are often anxious for no damn good reason. Um, again, fear is supposed to help us stay alive, help us deal with our survival needs. Our survival needs are things like I need shelter to stay out of the elements so I can you know, stay, stay warm when it's cold and cool when it's hot. Um, I need water, I need food, and because we're humans we need some kind of uh, uh, mental stimulation as well. We, we need to be making some kind of art or some kind of games, having companionship. We, we need that aspect as well. I think we start to go crazy. We, we don't take care of our mental health at that point. But really, if you have all those things met, you're done. No, no fear. Um, but modern life, because we have always, most of us have always lived in this sort of modern life example, we have no concept of what it's like to just have our basic needs met and that's it. Um, most people don't have to worry about where the next food is going, where the next meal is going to come from. Most people don't have to worry about having a roof over their head. Most people don't have to worry about having clean water, at least not in America. Throughout the rest of the world, it's, that's, that's a challenge. Um, but in the United States, um, you, you pretty much get all your needs met. And, and we also live in a system with, um, thanks to food stamps and Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid and welfare and disability checks, we even have this safety net that even if you can't provide those for yourself, there's avenues to get those provided for you as, as well. Um, I've, I've worked with a lot of low-income people. I've worked with people who uh, do not have even a high school diploma. Oftentimes they have multiple kids and, and they're, they're getting their basic needs met. They really don't have anything to be afraid of. What modern life teaches us is that we need to be afraid of Something bad is going to happen in one of those things, but more than likely what we need to be afraid of is ostracization. And this is a powerful tool as well. Humans are social creatures. We need to fit in. We need to belong. We need to be a part of a tribe or some sort of family or some sort of group. Uh, because in ancient times, an individual human was just lion food waiting to happen. Because an individual human probably wasn't going to make it on their own just because survival is so, so difficult. Uh, but a tribe, a group, they can survive pretty good. Um, some anthropologists I, I've read talked about 
they use uh, wolf packs as a metaphor for, or you know, uh, some, some something like that, um, as a metaphor for how humans may be hunted and lived uh, in prehistoric times, because an individual wolf really can't bring down a, a full-grown moose. A pack of wolves can. They'll just chase it until it's exhausted. They'll use this relay thing to just keep it running. And when it's finally exhausted, they can surround it and eventually they can bring it down. Chances are humans did the same thing. We chased down mammoths until they were exhausted. Maybe we even chased them off of a cliff, which a lot of the Native Americans seem to have done with the buffalo. Um, and then we would surround it and, and finish it off with, with spears and things. So, a, a uh, and, and it's believed that humans actually hunted the mammoths to extinction, that we were so efficient hunters that we, we wiped them out. Uh, then we had to move on to other things, like in uh, the plains, the North American plains, they moved on to buffalo. Um, but we as uh, individuals need to fit into that group because that group is going to help us survive. And so again, modern advertising, what they do is they play on that. Um, <clears throat> you're not going to get a, a, a woman because you don't drive a fancy car. You're not going to get a man because uh, you're not wearing the, the newest jewelry or the latest fashions. Um, other women are going to think you're kind of weird if you don't have the latest hairstyles. You know, other men are going to kind of think you're kind of odd if you're not wearing these new kind of shoes or something else like that. I mean, advertising, that's, that's basically what it is, is um, you're not going to get the opposite sex because of X, or you're going to be ostracized from your own group because of Y, or whatever, and it's all about keeping you, in, keeping you conforming. Now, conforming is okay. There's nothing wrong with conforming, because when I am... When I'm with my friends watching TV and playing games, I'm one way because I'm conforming to that group. When I go to a workshop for being a counselor on how to use like cognitive behavioral therapy, then I am another way because I'm conforming to that group. Conforming just means fitting into whatever social setting you're in at any given time. But the problem is, is what we do is we conform just to conform. We conform out of fear because we're afraid of being kicked out. And then what's worse is we act upon that fear by doing things like spending money we don't have on shit we don't need to impress people we really don't like. Um, so this is how fear can be used against us. So what we always have to be aware of is what are we afraid of? Paying attention to where fear comes up for each of us. Um, there's a, a branch of, relatively new branch of uh, counseling called somatic experiencing. Uh, som somatic comes from the term soma, which means the body. And so what, what they're looking at is where do we feel these emotions in our bodies? Because uh, emotions are still basically generated through hormones and chemicals and neurotransmitters. Um, a lot of fear is based off of adrenaline, but it seems to play off differently than like in anger, which is also uh, a function of adrenaline as well. And so where we feel that fear is going to be different for each person. But if you, through meditation, if you allow yourself to kind of feel the fear, but almost stay like an observer as well, you know, watch a scary movie and then watch yourself watch a scary movie, so to speak. Uh, where is it that you feel the fear? What what comes up? Uh, a lot of people they start doing this with their hands. You know they start doing it. I've known people who kind of they kind of twitchy in their face and you know, you know, don't really like that. You know. Some people feel it in their chest. They get like little short breaths, that sort of thing. They start breathing a little shallower. Some people feel their stomach tighten up. Um, this these are all parts of that uh, fight, flight, or freeze response because. When we, again, like I said, when we feel like we're afraid that we're going to die, then our bodies have to get ready to do something. Again, this is all basically evolutionary psychology. This is just survival 101. If I'm afraid, I need to be ready to do something about it. Um, maybe what I need to do is run away. Maybe what I need to do is just fight. Maybe sometimes what I really need to do is just collapse into a ball in the fetal position and not do anything um, because then no one will see me and they'll just walk on by. Um, 
but our body has to get ready to do something and so we're going to feel it somewhere in our body as to how it works once you learn where you feel your fear then you can always use that as like your own little thermometer your own little barometric gauge on how am i feeling right now because if you're aware of that feeling then you're also aware of how it's going to affect your thinking and so one of the best things to do is um, because most of the time we're afraid and things are truly not life-threatening then what you can do is you can pause because in a truly life-threatening situation you've got to act on it you've got to do something you've got you've got to move that's almost like a totally that's like a whole different channel on what to do when you're afraid, how to handle an active shooter or intruders in your house or anything else like that. What I'm talking about is when you feel fear, you don't know exactly why you're feeling the fear. Uh, there is no real direct threat. And the best way to do that is to just take a pause and let your emotions come back down. Emotions follow an arc, um, though people will often say that they feel like this all the time, feel like X all the time they really don't feel that way. There is a certain arc to it. Uh, the stimulus happens and that shoots up where we uh, our emotions and then after a time it just starts to taper back down. I've heard the number that can take about 20 minutes for emotion to fully kind of reset. Um, I think that's going to really vary on the person and situation and that, that sort of thing. I do know that if you feed that it keeps going. So if you watch a video on um, I don't know, the elections and someone is talking about how this politician is going to lead us into World War III and you keep thinking about that video and keep thinking about World War III and all the things that could happen to it and what could lead to it and what it would be like to experience that and, and what that, how that affect you and your family and all this sort of stuff. You've taken that little bit of fear that they've given you and you just run with it. And so what you have to do is become aware of your thoughts, become aware of your emotions and then start dialing it down and ratcheting it down. One of the ways that I like to do that is uh, a very good grounding technique, especially when you're feeling fear. There, there's a few grounding techniques. Um, one is to, um, well, let's, let's play this now. Uh, I'm going to pick a color. I would normally have my client pick the color, but I'm going to pick the color. And I'm going to say the color is blue. What I want you to do is to look around the room, look around the space that you're in, and look for five things that are the color blue. Okay. And once you've found those, then notice how you're feeling at the moment. Another trick is to uh, pick a letter. Uh, again, I'll pick a letter for you. Uh, we'll say the letter is uh, letter H. Now find five things that start with the letter H. Now what these two exercises are doing is they are um, playing with the, the notion, if you remember from our last video, that the brain cannot simultaneously be logical and cannot simultaneously be emotional. It, it's one or the other. The more emotional you are, the less logical you are. The more logical you are, the less emotional you are. And so what we're doing is forcing you to be logical. So in this case, like in the first case, I said, you know, look for things with a certain color. Well, now you have to kind of look around where your space is and see what the, it's like, well, could that be it? Maybe this thing, I need to find five things. It's a lot of things. There's not that many things are blue. Um, then the other one is to look for the things that start with a certain letter. Same, same concept. 
Uh, we are forcing your brain to start being logical. We're shoving it to the other end of the spectrum to where the emotions have to come down. It's going to be really hard to do in the moment because your, your brain is way over here working on an emotional level and we're trying to bring it all the way over here to where it's now working on a logical level. Uh, so it's not going to be easy, but that's how you bring it down. Things like taking long, slow, deep breaths. If you remember from the meditation video, I talked about you know, inflating your stomach, then inflating your chest, then holding it, then letting it out nice and slow. Inhale for four, hold for two, exhale for four. Nice, long, slow breathing. One of the things that it does is, of course, it gets a lot more oxygen in your system, which will help bring, bring your physiolo physiology down. But it's also, um, when we're afraid, our, our body gets into fight and flight mode. So one of the things it does is it starts to hold our breath or we start taking short, shallow breaths. By forcing ourselves to take long, slow, deep breaths, we're kind of fooling our brain or at least sending the signal to our brain that it's okay, we, we're, we're fine. We don't need to be afraid right now. Uh, we're, we are safe. And so we're physiologically sort of sending the message that I actually don't need to be afraid. And of course you can do these things simultaneously. You can take the long, slow, deep breath while you're also looking around the room for all of the blue things that you can identify. Um, another trick, another grounding trick is called uh, um, kind of working through the senses. So what you want to do is uh, first look around the room and identify five things that you can see. Then you want to look around the room and identify four things that you can hear. And then you want to uh, notice three things that you can touch, two things that you can uh, smell, and then one thing that you can taste. So it'll be five things you can see, four things you can hear, three things you can touch, two things you can smell, one thing you can taste. And what we're doing is, is we're forcing you to use all of your senses, and we're also forcing you to look around your immediate surroundings. One of the reasons why so many people are afraid is uh, we worry all the time. Worry is just a form of fear. It's a fear of something bad might happen in the future that might threaten us. It's one of the things that separates us from humans, as far as we can tell, is that we have a concept of what the future can be like. We also have a memory of what the past was like. And so if we remember bad things happening in the past, then we can, of course, assume that, well, they might happen again in the future. And again, a little bit of worry is okay because that drives us to doing something. If you're a little worried that you may not have enough food to get through the winter, you'll go out and get more food. And then once you have enough food, you're good to go and you can stop. Again, problem is though in modern life, we typically worry about stuff that has absolutely nothing to do with our survival. In, case, in some cases, we will worry about stuff that not only has happened, but probably never will happen. And in fact, can't ever happen but we'll still worry about them because that's the power of our mind. And so by using these other tricks, by constantly looking at what's going on around our space, what's going on with our bodies, what's going on here, taking a deep breath, bringing our thoughts back to the present moment, we shut down that worry about in the future because the future, no, I hate to bring it to you, no one knows if we have a future or not anyway. I mean, for all I know, I might, you know, die in a car crash on the way home, and I'll never even upload this video. Um, so what's the point in me worry about how I'm going to, like, pay my taxes next year or anything else like that? So, so using these techniques, it helps pull us out of worry and anxiety about the future and brings us back into the here and now. Because in reality, the here and now is the only thing that we can really focus on. It's the only thing we can really uh, fix. And so we have to really be focused here. So that's also why I like, I'm going to hit on this again, So I like for my clients to always meditate because meditation builds that part of your brain that helps it make it focus more on the here and now. It also helps you become more aware of your thoughts. So when you watch that video or when you watch that news broadcast and they jack up your fear and then you kind of run with it, you can catch yourself and go, oh, I, I'm just thinking about something that's stupid, that has nothing to do with me, won't even ever have anything to do with me, um, I, I can just let that go. 
So if you're aware of your thoughts, then you can do that. You can trip this thing up to where it won't take off. Because, like I said, the danger of fear is it makes you very easily manipulated and also makes you act rather stupidly because your brain is not operating right. Your brain cannot function right. So you have to keep control of fear. Uh, if you can keep control of fear, that actually even just spills over into a lot of the other emotions. We'll be talking about anger and we'll talk about sadness and we'll talk about happiness later. Uh, but uh, fear and anger are very closely tied. And this is, I, I'll talk more about that in my next video on, on anger. So anyway, I hope you uh, found this video uh, helpful. Uh, if you did, please subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, I also have a Patreon account, so if you uh, feel so generous, then please uh, donate to my Patreon account. And I will uh, see you all next time. Thanks. Bye.